A man who charged the police is shot outside Campbelltown railway station. Tonight, for the first time, the confronting pictures a 30 centimetre knife, guns and tasers drawn. Sydney housing prices facing a 30% crash with dire predictions for the market as the economy recovers. Another death linked to the Ruby Princess, the Premier considers reopening pubs and clubs. Builders in hospital, a brick wall collapses during backyard renovations. Reckless hoons on the Hume Highway, police arrest one, now the search for the other driver. Penrith star Nathan Cleary punished after admitting he cooked up the story behind his now notorious video. And Sydney's smartest motorway, a high-tech solution to improve travel times. Live from Sydney, 7 News with Mark Ferguson. Good evening. A man who lunged at police with a large knife has apologised to the officer who was forced to shoot him. Robert Hampton was high on ice when he pulled out the weapon after jumping the barriers at Campbelltown train station. Tonight, for the first time, we can show you the frightening moment police chased him down and opened fire. This is the moment a man almost lost his life. Gunned down by police, Robert Hampton had just moments earlier threatened them with a 30 centimetre knife. I know it was his job to arrest me and do what he had to do, Hampton told the court. I didn't mean for him to shoot me. I had no intention of hurting anyone. I'm sorry. A drug addict since the age of 11, Hampton had smoked ice for a week. He'd also started hearing voices in his head. It started a couple of days before that. Negative information that people were out to get me. It wasn't good. So he armed himself with the large knife that he bought from Woolworths at Minto Marketplace. At Campbelltown train station, he was asked to show a ticket. He instead showed them a knife. And thinking police were out to get him, he took off. Police tasers failed, culminating in a standoff. Oh, and he was shot in the stomach. The 41-year-old remained in hospital for three months. While the confrontation lasted just a few minutes, the repercussions for Robert Hampton will last for the rest of his life. He now wears a colostomy bag, which he needs to change up to six times a day. The judge will sentence him on Friday. I warn you, it will be a reasonably stern sentence. Robert Hampton is facing up to 15 years jail. Leonie Ryan, 7 News. Almost two months after it docked, the death toll from the Ruby Princess continues to climb. A 22nd passenger dying overnight. Now, as we look for a road out, the Premier is having second thoughts about stopping pubs from reopening as cafes and restaurants go all out to attract patrons in the countdown to Friday. With a 10-person maximum, some Sydney restaurants are going to extraordinary lengths to make their venues feel a little like the pre-COVID days. Cardboard customers to fill the empty space. Even taped background noise. Yep, add some of our friends. Uh, they're a talkative bunch, but yes, uh, hopefully it, it pays off. It has. Five dock dining booked out to its legal limit. We've got 18 people booked, so two sittings. But for so many businesses, it's no laughing matter. Pubs desperate for direction. Here at Hyde Park House, the venue's four floors empty. Publican Warren Livingston frustrated with government pub policy. You know, I think everybody, particularly in this game, thought there'd be a roadmap, thought there'd be a date where we could come out, but there's been nothing. But there could be a breakthrough on pub restaurant openings. After yesterday saying no, the Premier has shifted position. We're looking at opportunities in New South Wales where we might be able to do that. It goes to the heart that this is becoming more and more confusing. Livingston's threatened to go rogue, setting a July 16 date for reopening. The NRL set a date, uh, so we decided, a bit tongue-in-cheek, to set our own date. But the government's insisting caution is critical. This virus is amongst the community. We know it's out there somewhere. We also know that it could 
at any time flare up. That as news today of another death from the Ruby Princess, the 22nd. The exposure was on the cruise ship. Meaning the 81-year-old female passenger had battled at least 55 days with the virus. The state's other corona hotspot, Anglicare's New March Home, also reporting another two staff testing positive. There was a PPE breach. A resident fall last week knocked off a worker's protective equipment. They then infected two further staff. And Chris Reason joins me now from Royal North Shore Hospital. Chris, we're continuing to queue up for testing despite that slowdown in cases. Yeah, that's correct, Mark. Another 8,100 people lined up yesterday. And of those new March positives, uh, two of the of total six new cases across the state. A slip from yesterday's breakthrough result of zero positive cases. But the Premier has proudly announced this morning, too, that New South Wales is now doing more testing than any other country in the world. Some breaking news, too, Mark, tonight on that issue of pubs opening their restaurants. Um, we've learned, Seven News has learned, that senior Senior ministers and senior health officials are meeting tonight to discuss that issue and it is highly likely that they will give them the go-ahead to open from this Friday along with thousands of other restaurants across the state. A decision uh, expected to be announced on that sometime tomorrow. Mark? OK, Chris Reason, thank you. In the bleakest outlook yet for Sydney's property market, Australia's biggest home lender, the Commonwealth Bank, has forecast housing prices could plunge by nearly a third nationally. That's its worst case scenario in a prolonged COVID-19 downturn. But even its best case predicts huge falls for homeowners. With a health conscious return to property inspections and auctions, some say now's the time to dive into the market. My advice to buyers would be don't sit on the sidelines for too long. The next three months will provide the best buying opportunities that we've seen in some time. That, despite another bank warning of looming property pain. Today, the Commonwealth Bank forecast house prices to drop by 11% over the next three years in its most likely scenario, or by a staggering 32% in a prolonged downturn. One of the things you have to do is hope for the best, but also prepare for a more negative scenario. The market's soft, but I don't believe it'll drop 30 a fall of that size would set house prices back to 2009 levels. So losing more than 10 years of housing value growth in the space of what's probably uh, uh, less than a year. Much depends on reversing the spike in job losses. House prices are going to be hit hard unless we get people back to work. The forecasts were part of ComBank's third quarter trading update, which revealed a 23% fall in cash profit to $1.3 billion dollars and an extra $1.5 billion set aside to cover the pandemic fallout. After fielding more than a million requests for help, the bank has deferred 144,000 home, 71,000 business and 25,000 personal loans and says the most devastating hits to income, jobs and our economy are being taken right now. But of course, this potentially could extend for many months. And Network Finance Editor Gemma Acton joins me now. Gemma, record low interest rates are here to stay for a while yet. Yes, Mark, the Commonwealth Bank boss told me he, like many others, expects the Reserve Bank to keep rates on hold at 0.25% for a long period of time. Matt Common says the Commonwealth is seeing a rise in mortgage customers switching from variable to fixed interest rate loans and that the bulk of home loan applications coming in are for refinancing rather than new borrowing. Mark. OK, Gemma, thank you. The state students are being told to return to school as planned despite concerns over international cases of a potentially fatal disease linked to coronavirus. The federal government wants urgent research into the illness suspected to have killed at least three children in America. The beginnings of the return to childhood normality as students once again walk through the school gates. But it's the littlest learners who overseas are causing a big concern with mounting cases of an illness likened to Kawasaki disease and linked to coronavirus. Anything uh, you don't know about and it's new, uh, it's quite concerning. This little girl in the US ended up in intensive care but recovered. My stomach hurt really bad. In America, three children have died and in New York alone there have been 100 cases. It's also been reported in the UK, Italy and Spain. Symptoms include a fever, rash, abdominal pain and inflamed organs such as the heart or kidneys. While the Prime Minister ordered Chief Medical Officer Brendan Murphy to look out for this new illness, Australia so far has no reported cases. 
because it's so rare, it's unlikely to be seen in Australia, but we'll obviously, we've got alerts on it. We're always vigilant, as we are with coronavirus generally, looking for any consequences, any related conditions. As for what it means for our school kids... Recognition of this syndrome does not at this stage change any of our health advice about going back to school. Tom Saker, 7 News. In breaking news, the Queensland Government is exploring the option of buying the embattled airline Virgin Australia through its independent investment corporation. The state's treasurer confirmed the bid will be known as Project Marone and is aimed at retaining and creating aviation jobs in Queensland. At least 19 bidders are circling the airline, which went into administration last month. The administrators Deloitte hope to finalise the sale by June. There are fears of thousands of Australian jobs if a full-blown trade war erupts with our biggest export market. China's decision to suspend some beef imports has other industries worried they could be next. But the government still denies the rift is due to calls for a coronavirus inquiry. Australian abattoirs are becoming the meat in a diplomatic sandwich. We don't need another beef with China over this issue. But they've got one. We hold concerns for the way... Uh, this issue is being um, progressed at this point in time. Progressed by China slapping import bans on four abattoirs claiming certification breaches days after threatening 80% tariffs on Australian barley. You will always have uh, occasional bugbears that come up in a trading relationship. The concern? Those bugbears explode into a broader trade war. This could mean over 3,200 workers impacted. This is really serious. The Trade Minister seeking an urgent meeting with his Chinese counterpart met so far with silence, though not from the Chinese government-owned Global Times, warning the bans are a wake-up call for Australia to start sending positive signals, payback for Australia's support for an independent inquiry into the origins of the coronavirus pandemic. Chinese officials say both privately and publicly that these are unconnected matters. The wine industry is seeing increased demand from China. There's always been this slight disconnect between what this, the Chinese government says and what the consumers do. So they're telling us that they're going to continue to drink our wine. And adding more confusion, the banned Kilcoy Meatworks in Brisbane is owned by a Beijing-based private equity firm. And there is an upside for Australian consumers. The export ban will lead to greater meat supply in our domestic market and cheaper prices. Mark Riley, 7 News. Four building workers were injured too seriously after being hit by a toppling brick wall at Willara today. Paramedics say such accidents are becoming more frequent as people use the lockdown to tackle home renovations. Emergency crews confronted with multiple injured at a Sydney building site. A brick wall had collapsed at the rear of the terrace, four builders near it. He's had a larger brick wall fall from a height, impacting him from behind. Neighbours heard the crash, rushing to discover a pile of rubble. And I saw one of the guys emerge, covered in dust and blood, and he was saying, help, help. Bricks had to be pulled off a 26-year-old man, left with a suspected fractured skull. Ran over with my towel, had a bit of a, a big cut in his back of his head, tried to sort of get him to sit down, covered it up. It was chaotic, yeah. There were police and ambulance arrived amazingly quickly after the noise. With the site still unstable, ambulance crews work quickly on a builder in his 50s with chest injuries. His sons in their 20s had minor leg and back injuries. There has been a worrying trend recently. Paramedics say they're attending an increasing number of workplace accidents. They're calling for greater vigilance with safety. Work safety inspectors examine today's accident scene. The two more seriously injured builders are in a stable condition at St Vincent's Hospital. Just seeing them come out and just be battered and bruised like that, I was like, wow, that's, it's, it's lucky they're alive, to be honest. Chris Ma, 7. A dash cam has captured a dangerous highway standoff between a truck and a ute southwest of Sydney last weekend. Police say everyone who sees the road rage video will be shocked and claim the two reckless drivers should be embarrassed. On the Hume Highway going 100 kilometres an hour, not fast enough for this driver, the dark ute tearing up the shoulder trying to overtake a truck, refusing to move out of the right lane. They swerve and ram each other in a dangerous game of cat and mouse. 
It's this sort of driving behaviour that costs lives on our roads. It happened at Menangal on Saturday morning. Police have charged the truck driver, but they're still looking for the person in the ute. Those who travel that route say they regularly see behaviour like this. People cutting in on you and... They're not saving their life, they're saving seconds, you know. 118 people have died so far this year in New South Wales, but with health restrictions seeing fewer people out, the road toll is 23 less than last year. While the road toll might be down, new data shows drivers have been taking more risks during coronavirus lockdowns with rates of speeding, drink driving, running red lights and mobile phone use all up. The results of that are really quite uh, quite astounding uh, and that sort of behaviour won't be tolerated. And with traffic picking up as restrictions ease, police say driving behaviour needs to improve. This is about personal responsibility for the individual once they turn that key. Andrew Denny, 7 News. Panther star Nathan Cleary has been fined $1,000 by police after he lied to the NRL Integrity Unit uh, over breaking social distancing rules. It has now emerged he left his home to pick up the girls he danced with in that TikTok video, the new fine adding to the 30 grand already imposed by league bosses. Nathan Cleary's apology reached thousands of Panthers and NRL fans. Just want to apologise for my actions. Uh, my actions were irresponsible, uh, selfish and, and just pretty plain stupid. But his lies have attracted the most attention. Originally, he told officers the girls in this TikTok video caught an Uber to his house, but that's not true. Cleary picked them up. There will be some further inquiries made uh, into that uh, over the coming days. Police wasted no time. At 2pm today, Cleary was emailed a penalty infringement notice for breaching non-essential travel restrictions. The same fib was fed to the NRL Integrity Unit. It's now cost him two games and $31,000. Although it's unlikely, Nathan Cleary and the Penrith Panthers do have the option to contest the infringement if they feel it's unfair. That's exactly what Melbourne Storm winger Josh Adokar intends to do. We believe that ultimately, uh, having a look at them, that there may be grounds for him to defend these matters. The test winger argues that he did have good reasons to travel to Latrell Mitchell's farm and that he did adhere to social distancing measures. Adokar also faces firearms charges. He'll appear in court in August. Peter Fegan, 7 News. A trio of Outback nurses has received a call from royalty. The Duchess of Cambridge and the Countess of Wessex dialed into Mount Isa to recognise the work of health workers as part of International Nurses Day. And the Queen has been making calls too. For the first time, a chance to hear the Queen on the phone with a leading nurse. Good afternoon, Your Majesty. Good afternoon. This is rather an important day. Oh, it is. It's quite special. The International Nurses Day has been recognised by the general public. Yes, because they obviously had a very important part to play recently. As the royal family dialed into nurses around the world to say... Thank you for everything you're doing. My family and I want to join in the chorus of thank yous to nursing and midwifery staff all over the country and indeed the world. A message heard in Outback Queensland at Gidgee Healing in Mount Isa, where nurses received a call from Kate and Sophie. We'd love to hear what it's like on the ground. It's been as hectic as it has been around the world, I would say. In the emergency department, obviously stepping up our protocols and guidelines. I hope you're feeling some of the love as well. We thought we were just doing an interview with the International Council of Nursing until they broke the news that there was going to be some royal presence presence on the on the other end of the line. We're extremely nervous, cautious to the state where we actually um, thought it was the day before and we're sitting up <laughs> at midnight getting prepped for. Prep for the interview, but that's okay. We had a good um, dummy run. Video calls have fast replaced traditional engagements for the Royals and with little prospect of international tours this year, they're now more able to easily connect with the Commonwealth and send a simple message of thanks. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. In London, Hugh Whitfeld, 7 News. An RFS hazard reduction burn in the Royal National Park, which began yesterday, is still sending plenty of smoke across Sydney South. While not clear, the skies were bathed in a gorgeous sunset this evening. The cooler months produced some of Sydney's most stunning sunsets. Yes. Time now for a check on more of our weather. Here's Brownie.
Thanks very much, Virgo. Cold today with increasing cloud. Yes, there is a change on the way. Now, the city reached a maximum of only 19.4 degrees. That happened by late afternoon. Cold in Penrith, though, only 16.1. And how's this for a stunning sunrise on the central coast? In fact, we're standing at the Terrigal Surf Lifesaving Club. You see that high-level cloud just moving in, which is an indication of an approaching change. In fact, this is it. As we go to uh, current conditions, we can see it now pushing up the uh, coast. It's an unstable southerly. The first stage moved through just a short time ago. Tomorrow, we're expecting this, scattered showers over our part of the world. But uh, most of the activity should be east of Parramatta. Not a lot of rain at this stage, around 10 to 15 millimetres coastal, a little bit less once you head inland. Of course, I'll have the weekend weather in detail, top of the hour, Fergo. OK, David, thank you. Toyota has issued an urgent recall for one of its most popular vehicles. Next, fears some land cruisers could burst into flames. Which models are affected? Also a $3 million boost to train extra nurses for a potential winter wave of COVID-19. A trainee pilot dies when he's playing clips power lines, crashing next to a busy road. Later, the new smart motorway set to slash congestion when Sydney gets back to work. And it's for an NRL club's ultimatum to players who refuse the flu vaccine. Welcome back. More than 20,000 Toyota Land Cruisers are being urgently recalled over fears they could burst into flames. Consumer watchdog the ACCC says if dry vegetation builds up around the vehicle's underbody and exhaust system, it could catch a light. Customers are urged to contact a Toyota dealer for models bought between 2016 and 2018. Afghanistan has resumed offensive operations against the Taliban following a brutal attack on mothers and newborn babies. Gunmen stormed a Doctors Without Borders maternity ward, a four-hour battle that left 16 people dead. A warning, this report contains confronting images. Hours old and wrapped in blood-stained blankets. As a gun battle raged inside the hospital, help arrived for dozens of newborns, seeing sunlight for the first time from the arms of Afghan soldiers. At least three gunmen attacked the hospital in the capital, Kabul, just before 10 a.m. A man wearing uniform of the police arrived and started shooting at guards and some women at the hospital entrance. Storming the maternity ward with grenades and guns. I saw eight dead bodies of women in this ward and seven other dead bodies were in the other wards on the beds. We call on all, on all parties involved in the battle in Afghanistan to respect the national and international treaties. More bloodshed in the country's east. A suicide bomber killing 24 people at a funeral of a police commander. The Taliban, having signed a peace agreement with the US in February, denied the attacks. Still, Afghanistan President Ashraf Ghani ordered security forces back on the offensive. Another round of conflict in a seemingly endless war. Ashley Mullaney, 7 News. A student pilot's been killed after clipping power lines in suburban Florida. He was attempting an emergency landing after reporting mechanical problems, crashing just outside a shopping centre. A pedestrian was injured after being hit by debris. The flight instructor was seriously hurt. A couple's been saved after plunging 60 metres down a cliff in California. Fire crews used a two-line rope system to pull the man and woman to safety. It appears they slammed through a sign on a dead-end street and went straight over the edge. The state government has conceded that Friday's relaxation of the corona lockdown will very likely see a spike in case numbers. It's a gamble, but to hedge the bet, 1,500 nurses have been given refresher courses in intensive care management just in case. Rapid retraining for our health heroes to treat pandemic patients in intensive care. You keep going down until you can't go any further. Ben Wright usually works in operating theatres. He's one of 1,500 registered nurses upskilling to take on coronavirus at its worst. It relieves some of those fears and anxieties about the potential for being put into an ICU, having to look after a ventilated patient who's critically unwell. A $3 million investment by the state government. To make sure that if we need to call upon them, they are willing and able to assist us in dealing with those uh, intensive care patients. If you're in intensive care, you're requiring 
very, very highly skilled care. With the virus expected to linger, ventilator numbers have been doubled, with more on the way. This is not normal times. This is definitely not normal times. Right now, the number of COVID patients in intensive care is extremely low. However, the government concedes the easing of restrictions on Friday could change that, saying this training program will make sure we're prepared. Because no matter how well we seem to be managing, the virus is still out there. We have seen overseas uh, what can happen when complacency sets in. As we work to keep cases down. Natasha Squarey, 7 News. A man has faced Parramatta Court charged over a notorious Sydney cold case. Next, what led police to the alleged killer of American student Scott Johnson. Also a man jailed over a frenzied hammer attack at a Western Sydney bottle shop. New plans to fast track the fish market redevelopment, transforming the site into high rise housing. And the young deer feeling a little sheepish after getting lost. That's next. Welcome back. A man has faced court over the 1988 North Head murder, believed to have been a sickening homophobic attack. New details emerged today over what police believe happened to Scott Johnson as lead investigators made a powerful admission over the force's past handling of gay hate crimes. For police, this is the cleansing of sins, of neglectful investigations when gay men in the 80s and 90s died in suspicious circumstances. The plight of, of young, particularly gay men in, in Sydney, probably around the world, was a very difficult one. Not only were they let down by police, I think they were let down by the community. At least 27 unexplained deaths are believed to have been motivated by homophobia, and at the time, Scott Johnson was deemed to have killed himself. I think the gay community um, has grown to see Scott as a symbol of the dozens of other gay men who died during this terrible period. Police say the 27-year-old met his alleged killer, Scott White, at a manly pub, walked to North Head, and when Johnson removed his clothing, White punched him before the young American fell to his death. When we got the job, we didn't have a, a body, we didn't have DNA evidence, we didn't have forensic evidence. An estranged relative of the accused is now a protected witness and eligible for a $2 million reward. Police failures are not the only reason the Scott Johnson investigation has been so controversial. It has also been political. When former police minister Mike Gallagher perceived an injustice and pushed for more scrutiny of the case, he was even accused of taking bribes from the victim's wealthy family to prioritise their case. Totally false, but clearly this is vindication. Uh, the last 24 hours has been uh, quite a, an emotional ride. White did not apply for bail today. Robert Ovadia, 7 News. A man who tried to rob a Western Sydney bottle shop with a hammer has been sentenced to more than three years jail. Jimmy Tongamoa was with two other men when they barged into the Guildford Bottle Mart in May last year, assaulting this store worker. They left empty-handed. With time served, 21-year-old Tongamoa will be eligible for parole next March. Sydney's ferries have returned to action after an industrial dispute saw multiple services cancelled this afternoon. Workers walked off the job earlier after a colleague was dismissed for allegedly failing an alcohol test. Commuters are being warned that delays are expected as services resume this evening. America's leading expert on COVID-19 has delivered a blunt warning. Reopening too soon could trigger an outbreak that can't be controlled. Dr Anthony Fauci testified about the risk in a fiery hearing as politicians push back on the president's claim that the US has prevailed on testing. Senators in a hearing like never before. Virus fears meant they weren't ready to all be in the same room as they heard a blunt warning to any state moving too fast. There is a real risk that you will trigger an outbreak that you may not be able to control, not only leading to some suffering and death that could be avoided, but could even set you back on the road to trying to get economic recovery. But one senator wanting schools reopened hit back. I don't think you're the end all. I don't think you're the one person that gets to make a decision. I have never made myself out to be the end all. I give advice according to the best scientific evidence. After Donald Trump claimed... We have prevailed. ...on testing, Republican senators responded... Impressive, but not nearly enough. 
I find our testing record nothing to celebrate whatsoever. Experts saying millions more tests each week are needed as America's projected death toll was today increased to 147,000 by August. While some parts of the country are seeing light at the end of the tunnel, here at the epicenter there's still plenty of dark ahead. New York's Broadway theatres, which have been closed for two months, today announced that all shows are now cancelled until at least September. Dr Fauci, hopeful proposed vaccines will show signs of success by year's end. The concern now, there won't be enough vials and syringes for hundreds of millions of doses. In New York, Paul Karak, 7 News. The site of the Sydney fish market could be home to skyscrapers on par with the city under new plans released by the state government. The proposal is one of three options being considered for when the market relocates. Taking a wrecking ball to Blackwattle Bay. Work officially underway on the new fish markets. Now the state government is eyeing off the prime harbourside land the tourist hotspot will leave behind. Infrastructure New South Wales releasing three options for public consultation. They include skyscraper top podiums with a commercial preference, larger buildings with a focus on floor space and office use, or tall, slender high-rises for apartment living. Piermont is already the most densely populated part of the country. Uh, this is not a place where we should be locating more high-end residential. Community groups warn the new plan goes too far. It's not on. It, it will destroy the character. Time is running out for the government to decide what to do with the old site, with construction to begin on the new fish markets by the end of the year, with vendors due to move in by 2024. Infrastructure New South Wales and the Planning Minister declined to comment on camera, but in a statement say they're calling for community feedback. We've been engaged in inverted commas for so many years on this and we're dudded. We're totally and utterly dudded. Cameron Price, 7 News. There was an odd sight in a Tassie shearing shed when a young deer found itself a little lost. The confused fawn somehow wandered into a sheep pen and seemed right at home with the new friends. The sheep appeared unfazed, treating the visitor as one of their own. With retailers struggling, now is the time to bag a bargain. Next, expert tips to help you haggle your way to a better deal. Plus, he was collared in a dramatic citizen's arrest while fleeing from police. Why a court has now set him free. The new high-tech motorway set to transform your commute. Soon in sport, a shark star's blunt message to NRL players refusing to get the flu shot. Cold and cloudy today, pressure is falling, a change is building. See you soon. The ASX 200 scraped over the line today, closing up 18 points. A late surge by the Commonwealth Bank helped the session push higher. Regional carrier Rex rose 32 per cent after flagging plans to fly major domestic routes. And one Aussie dollar is buying just under 65 US cents. The price of unleaded is sitting steady right now, averaging $1.14 a litre across Sydney. Much cheaper if you go looking. We spotted it for 89.9 cents in Yaguna. A church advertising a so-called miracle cure for COVID-19 has been fined $150,000 by the Therapeutic Goods Administration. The website for the Australian chapter of the Genesis 2, 2 Church of Health and Healing claims a solution containing sodium chloride, typically used as bleach and disinfectant, can reverse cancer, AIDS and coronavirus. The TGA fears the solution could in fact send people to hospital. The church's website says it no longer is taking phone calls because of harassment and attacks. A man on the run from police who was tackled to the ground by a good Samaritan has had his jail sentence slashed. After pleading guilty to dozens of charges, 41-year-old Akin Sen was sentenced to 18 months behind bars. Despite the seriousness of the offences, the magistrate made him eligible for parole immediately, saying coronavirus had made prisons more dangerous. With some lockdown restrictions beginning to ease, small retailers are offering discounts and deals to keep their doors open. Marketing experts say haggling is part of the new norm when shopping as we head out of this corona crisis. They've already paid for their stock. Now small retailers are finding fresh ways to get the sales they desperately need. Haggling is not a common thing in the Western world, but if that's the way they can um, 
attract customers to clear up their uh, old inventories, why not? Peter Palomino thought she'd have to close her doors by now. Instead, she's bargaining with buyers to keep trading. If I can make a sale of any sort, I will. You know, if I'm losing, you know, 40%, I'm still making something. Typically, we ask for discounts on big ticket items like white goods. That's trickling down to everyday items like fashion. I think it's um, imperative that people get out and spend their money. So if that means that the shopkeeper has to negotiate with the customer, that's the way it is. There was actually a surge in retail sales of 8.5% in March, but almost all of that went to the supermarkets and the in-demand chains like Bunnings and The Good Guys, which actually encourage haggling. But how you haggle makes all the difference. Don't be a bully. Being friendly works. Offer cash instead of your credit card. Ask for extras, a gift with a purchase. Offer to buy more, take two for one for a discount. And become a loyal customer. They'll look after you if they know you'll be back. If someone's reasonable, I'm happy to haggle with them. Brian Seymour, 7 News. The roads may be quiet now, but as restrictions ease, Sydney's traffic nightmare will be back. Coming up, the new smart motorway set to save Western Sydney drivers hours a week. Don't miss that story soon on 7 News. But now Mel is here with Sport. Mel, the NRL's anti-vaxxers continue to divide opinion. Yeah, they do, Fergo. With deadline day looming for players refusing to get the flu vaccination, some have spoken for and others against their stance. Details up next. Plus, the Bunnies return to training with a huge message of support for troubled teammate James Roberts. And see this former AFL star take early tea time to a whole new level as Victoria finally lifts its controversial golf ban at the stroke of midnight. Welcome back. Titans captain Ryan James says his anti-vax teammates should be admired for bravery if they take their stance all the way to the courts. The club set tomorrow as a deadline for Bryce Cartwright and Brian Kelly to conform to Queensland's no jab, no play rules. After an off-season ACL knee injury and six-week rehab setback in shutdown, Ryan James would give anything to be playing. Going back to half normality and, um, yeah, it's making the rehab a little bit easier. The Titans have told Bryce Cartwright and Brian Kelly to have their flu shots by tomorrow. I respect everything Bryce and Brian are doing and, um, you know, it's what they believe in and what their family believes in. At four other clubs too, they're facing the quandary. In a team sport, does individual choice now come first? Well, that's a tough one. <laughs> Without them, you know, we wouldn't you know, be where we are, so I, I'd definitely say uh, that, uh, that they would come first. Even if it means losing teammates for games in Queensland, Englishman John Bateman won't tell anyone what to do with their bodies. I have 10 beers a weekend or something like that. It's probably out of the best of a corner and stuff like that. I'll probably put a lot worse in my body with a beer and stuff like that. All power to them. Um, there's not too many people in you know, history that would be willing to fight such a big battle and um, you know, make my mistake. It's probably one of the biggest battles that has happened in, around you know, this country. We're going to extreme lengths to get this game back up and running and we've got to show you know, the public, the government, that we're following all these protocols. At Redfern, the Rabbitohs trained with the absent James Roberts in their thoughts. I just like to say I'm very proud of James and what he's done. He realised the situation he was in and he's, he's reached out for help and, and we're very happy that he's getting the help that he's needed. Slowing ruck speeds by going back to one ref won't help Damien Cook, but he says changing the rules mid-season's OK because everything's unusual this year. If there's a right time to do it, this might be the way to do it. I'm open to anything. Well, let's go live now to Matt Carmichael at League Central. Matty, there is an important commission meeting happening now. Yeah, good evening, Mel. It could be a long time because there's a lot to discuss. Firstly, that decision on the two referees. Now, after a lot of opposition, it was very notable to hear some of those senior players softening their stance on going back to one referee today. Also, the long-awaited draw, the coaches, players, fans, we're all waiting to see this and hoping it will finally get it by Friday, including if the Raiders, Storm and Queensland teams can play their home games, then the really curly one, what to do about those players who won't have the vaccinations, Mel? All right, thanks very much, Matt Carmichael there at Rugby League HQ. Well, some of League's biggest names have united for an important public health message urging the public to download the COVID safe app. As a footy player, I know how important it is to stop the spread of coronavirus so we can get back to a normal life. We all want to stop the spread. It's so important that we get as many people as possible downloading the COVID safe app. The app help keeps you, your family and your community safe from further spread of the coronavirus. 
Commission Chairman Peter Volandes says the app is key to the NRL's health protocols as well as the easing of government restrictions. Well, there aren't many things capable of reducing AFL hard men to tears, but as league-wide COVID-19 testing started today, the invasive nasal swab led to watery eyes all over the place. I'm a little bit sensitive at the moment. A few tears came down. It was... Uh... Oh, look, it's all... All are positive, we're just uh, keen to play. So whatever's going to get us back as soon as possible, we're prepared to do. All players will be tested by Friday as the AFL looks to restart the season as early as June 11. What about this? The COVID-19 enforced ban on golf in Victoria has been a huge source of frustration for locals. When the ban ended at midnight, former AFL star Nick Del Santo wasn't waiting any longer. Is that a golf club? A golf club? No. Del Santo went straight to his local club for a hit using special glow-in-the-dark tees, balls and flagsticks. The triple All-Australian was no doubt the first of many avid golfers to hit the fairways today. It certainly was a long and pretty controversial wait, Fergo. It looks like so much fun. Maybe a lot of people start playing at night. Why not? Take a long time to put those uh, flagpoles out <laughs> before, <laughs> How cool before the game, though. Yeah. Good on you, Mel. Thanks. Thank you. Sydney's first smart motorway is almost ready to roll, promising to save drivers on the M4 up to 15 minutes in the car. The final pieces of technology that have just been installed will change the way more than 150,000 vehicles use the road every day. The fast forward button has been pressed with the final five overhead gantries installed on the M4 in just one night. Workers normally erect two at a time, but have taken advantage of reduced traffic to reach a major milestone. All 46 gantries stretching from just west of Parramatta to the foot of the Blue Mountains in place and ready to be switched on within weeks. We're still working towards around the middle of this year to get the system in place. The $600 million project is the first of its kind in New South Wales. The gantries displaying changeable speed and lane signals with quick change traffic lights at on ramps as well to improve the flow of traffic. It's a logical use of technology and it will continue to be rolled out across the motorway network. 12 specialist staff now in training to operate the technology when it goes live. There's a lot of information coming in at one point in time but because we have all got that experience to draw on it's actually really exciting to have it available to us. It's estimated the system will reduce crashes by up to 30%, saving drivers up to 15 minutes across the 35-kilometre end-to-end journey. As you approach them, the gantries look similar to a toll point or somewhere cameras might be installed to catch drivers breaking the law, but we're being assured they won't be used to raise revenue. They're not there to catch you out, they're there to help. Alex Hart, 7 News. David is back now with the latest on our weather. Browning, not quite the day we were expecting. Yeah, that's right, uh, Fergo. The cloud blocked the uh, mild autumn sun. Too cold for sun today. Showers tomorrow. Weekend details soon. Tonight's 7 News headlines. A man has apologised to the police officer who was forced to shoot him after he pulled out a knife last year at Campbelltown Station. Senior ministers are tonight deciding whether pubs and clubs will be allowed to reopen on Friday. And the Queensland Government has confirmed it's considering making a bid for a stake in Virgin Australia. Now, the latest on our weather, here's David. Thanks very much, uh, Fergo. Our run of settled weather, well, that's gradually drawing to a close. We're expecting a few showers tomorrow, most of that happening near the coast. Now, it was a much cooler day than forecast. Quite simply, too much middle-level cloud and not enough sun. The top, 19.4 degrees, well short of that forecast, 22. Into the suburbs, you'll notice it was a much colder day in the greater western. In fact, 16 degrees uh, was recorded in both uh, Penrith and Camden. That was around about mid-afternoon. From our weather eye in the sky, this is the change. We're expecting to reach the Harbour City. It is now pushing up towards the uh, central coast. That said, though, as you look at the forecast model for the next 24 hours, the bulk of that wet weather will remain offshore during that forecast period. Just a few showers are expected to clip central and northern parts of our coast, uh, remaining dry for most of our state, including uh, Canberra tomorrow. In fact, a sunny top of around 14 degrees is expected. Melbourne, cold and clear in around 15 degrees. A warmer day is expected to unfold in Perth. Lots of sunshine, forecast top 
around about uh, 27 degrees. For our day, for our state, I should say, fine for most of the day. For the bulk of the state, just those showers around central and northern areas. I think most f rainfall totals generally around 5 to 10 millimetres uh, coastal. But uh, as you can see from our forecast maximum, it will be a cold day overall. And of course, that includes the Sydney Basin as well. We're looking at our model generating shower activity. The bulk of that is expected to fall east of Parramatta. As I mentioned earlier, coastal falls potentially around 10 to 15 millimetres. Once you get east of Parramatta, I think we'll see falls generally less than a couple of millimetres. Coastal waters, moderate seas on top of a low southerly swell. That's south to south easterly, running at around about 15 to 20 knots. For the city, grab a brolly. Tomorrow you'll need a jacket as well. Forecast top of only 18 degrees. Let's move on to the seven-day outlook now. The showers should clear during Friday. As for the weekend, it will be cool. Cloudy for most of Saturday. I think we'll see some sunshine breaking through on Sunday and a little bit warmer. So brolly weather tomorrow, Fergo. A wet one on the way. Indeed. Good on you, Brownie. That is 7 News for this Wednesday. We'll have updates for you throughout the evening. I'm Mark Ferguson from all the team. I hope you have a great night.